talk about number theory, Dr. Russell is going to talk about, about geometry, and Dr. Cardos is going to talk about real analysis. So I start? You can start. <laughs> can I do both? Um, so, <clears throat> is this supposed, to, this is supposed to be a lecture or supposed to be a discussion? I'm not really sure. But, but I'm going to do whatever I want, and you'll have to be okay with it. <laughs> um, and we were asked to spend 15 to 20 minutes talking about, A, what inspired us to become mathematicians and go into the area that we're in, um, and then B, what upper level math classes we take, why the upper level math classes we take in college are important to, I guess, K-12 to teaching. Um, so what inspired me to become a mathematician? There's a cynical perspective and a non-cynical perspective. The cynical perspective is I wanted to be a physicist, but then I hated doing all my lab work. Uh, and so as I went through all the lab work, I was forced to take all the math courses. Um, I realized I liked the math part of it, but I didn't like the lab work. And so a mathematician felt like physicists, but without labs. Um, but that's not actually very true. Um, the non-cynical and probably more honest perspective is that I had really, really good teachers in college, excellent teachers in college, who um, who pushed me when they saw you can come in. Who pushed me when they saw that I was doing well. I did well um, in certain courses for certain reasons, and I jumped into analysis um, halfway through the semester because I felt like um, I could, and I, I, I changed majors to mathematics and jumped into analysis halfway through the semester, and I was able to catch up. And at different moments, I had professors who were just like, you, you sort of belong in graduate school, eventually. They sort of convinced me that it's something I should consider looking into. Um, so that's what inspired me to become a mathematician, was my really good math professors. Uh, but I didn't know until my fourth year that I was going to even think about going into grad school. Um, and so it took, it took a while to figure that out. Uh, you're welcome to come sit down. Mm -hmm. um, don't let me stop you. Um, so if you want, you can ask me more about my history. It's not very interesting. Um, but I can tell you a bit about number theory and why number theory is important to the K-12 curriculum, and also to people who are pre-service K-12 teachers. Um, and to be honest, I'm not the right person to be talking about this. There are better people to be talking about this, people who have both taught number theory and worked in the K-12 setting. I've worked with K-12 students, but never in the K-12 setting. Um, so what I did is I went to the library. It's the first time I used the TCNJ library. <laughs> and I got this book called Learning and Teaching Number Theory. It's by Campbell and Z Zazkis. And it's pretty cool. I just read through a bit of it, um, like the introduction, basically. And I have some quotes from it that I'll say. Um, but the thesis of this book is that number theory uh, as a subject is uh, completely all-encompassing in terms of all the different mathematical approaches and mathematical subject mastery a student needs through K-12. You can sort of touch all the different bases with number theory and you can do it in a way that's approachable at almost any age group um, and they go through actually like moment-to-moment teacher-student, teacher-student sort of interactions in this book. It's kind of cool. So if you're interested in like using number theory in the K-12 curriculum as a teacher one day, or if you're just interested in the, how people view teaching K-12 with the number theory in mind, this is a really neat book. Uh, so before I start, I guess I wanted to ask what you think mathematics is. Because if you're going to teach mathematics, you should know what it is. So I'm going to ask you, what's mathematics? And I'm going to force you into discussion now. So you have to answer. Someone's got to answer at some point, otherwise I'm done. <laughs> well, what's mathematics? I think it's using background knowledge to solve something that you don't already know. So does it matter what you're solving? Um, uh, you don't have to answer that. Problem. Okay. So, so what, what else do you see mathematics being? What's mathematics? Yeah. When you're a little, you're kind of taught it's the study of numbers. The study of numbers? <laughs> okay, so certainly a lot of people would answer it's the study of numbers. Is there any other answers to what is mathematics? Yeah. I guess it would 
think you said that it's the um, process of reasoning and justifying a solution to okay. a problem, whether it's like real world or so problem solving and reasoning are also things that are involved when you try to figure out what is mathematics. Numbers is something that comes up when you think about what is mathematics. Structure, the word structure often comes up. Just studying things that are structured, objects and structure within objects and objects that are structured. Um, if you don't have a solid answer for what is mathematics, like a paragraph that you can spout at length, then all the students you who approach you when you're teaching K to 12 who say, well, what is mathematics? They're going to they're gonna expect that answer. So I encourage you, um, just so you feel good about being able to say something when someone asks what is mathematics, at some point come up with like a paragraph answer for what is mathematics. So that all the annoying kids who show up at your door on the first day of class being like, why am I even taking this? What is math? You can say something. Um, and they're not annoying. They're wonderful. I take that back. <laughs> um, so historically, right, there's a, there's a certain idea of what is mathematics, and now there's a certain idea of what is mathematics, and those might not have been the same thing. So if you're in a science class, or a polit polit political science class, or a biology class, um, uh, or, or any class in, in high school, that often they approach the subject from two different ways. How has it been done in the past, and how is it be, being done currently? And mathematics, historically, had an approach that was very example-driven, and very grounded in things we can sort of see and feel. Um, but also, it was also, it was also uh, began, even historically, as an effort to abstract from those things we can see and feel into ideas. Um, and so what, the first quote in this book is the following. Since the beginning of the ancient Greek Pythagorean tradition over two and a half millennia ago, striving for a conceptual understanding of numbers and their properties, patterns, structures, and forms, has constituted the heart, if not the soul, of mathematics and mathematical thinking. So I think that's a nice approach to trying to understand what is mathematics, at least from a historical perspective. Nowadays, mathematics is a lot more. It's a much bigger thing than just the study of numbers and patterns and structures. There's, there's more to it, and it has more applications as well. Um, and, and one of the nice things about number theory is you can touch both a really nice sounding uh, quote like this in terms of what is mathematics and also the applications it has even in the modern day era just from the basics of number theory and so that's why I think number theory is a useful thing to do in the classroom because you can see a lot of the different parts of mathematics uh, in number theory. Um, so to move on from that the notion of mathematical meaning can have two different thoughts. You, you could say it might be just activities involving various operations procedures, functions, relations, and applications using numbers and maybe or potentially these things are grounded in familiar day-to-day -day, real world experiences. So that's sort of like an example based approach to what is mathematics. Mathematics is a whole bunch of activities that we do that involve numbers, functions, structure, procedures, operations. Uh, it might be grounded in day-to-day -day experiences but it might not be. Um, but there's another side to that coin, like I'm saying, it's also just the notion of developing a conceptual foundation for making clear and general abstract distinctions about objects and structure, right? And so one's a more formal, more um, conceptual approach, and the other's a more example-based approach. And you can really touch both of those in a course in number theory. Probably in any, everything I'm saying probably applies to every course in mathematics, so I shouldn't just say in number theory. but. It, at a very foundational, or I should say, approachable level, number theory can give you access to all of that with simple questions and simple uh, and, and simply stated questions. Uh, Gauss is this person here. <laughs> it's a picture of Gauss, Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, he was once called the Prince of Mathematics by some mathematician, um, and he called number theory the queen of mathematics. Uh, he felt number theory was sort of like the pinnacle of, uh, or, or the, um, I guess, I, I would say he probably felt it was like the ideal representative of what mathematics feels like in some sense. It's, it's, it's the one subject area that he called the queen of mathematics. Um, so he really liked it, and so that's a good reason to study it. Um, but in 1989, if you read the National Council of Teachers in Mathematics Curriculum Evaluation Standards, they also say something about mathematics that would encourage you maybe to study it. 
um, or, or number theory, which would encourage you to study it. Number theory offers many rich opportunities. This is a quote. Number theory offers many rich opportunities for explorations that are interesting, enjoyable, and useful. These explorations have payoffs in problem solving and understanding and developing other mathematical concepts and illustrating the beauty of mathematics and in understanding the human aspects of the historical development of the number. Number theory is one of the oldest subjects in mathematics. It begins with what's a number and ends with uh, a whole bunch of crazy stuff that goes on forever and is still going on today. Uh, and it touches a lot of the different areas of mathematics, starting from just the question of what is a number and how are they related to each other. Um, so a lot of you have taken number theory. Um, so I'll ask some more questions. If, if I were to name some areas of study that you know show up in the K-12 mathematics curriculum, I would start thinking about things like num numerical patterns. You study numerical patterns in the K-12 curriculum. You study algorithmic procedures and numerical procedures in the K-12 curriculum. You study numerical and structural concepts. Uh, you study reasoning and you study problem solving. So those of you who have taken number theory, can you give me an example of how number theory has helped you understand better either numerical patterns or algorithmic procedures or structural concepts or reasoning or problem solving? If you've taken number theory, do you remember a single algorithm you learned in number theory? Yeah. Euclidean. The Euclidean algorithm. Number theory has got the Euclidean algorithm. It's one of the first things you see. Uh, and it's, it's something you can teach a high school student. In fact, I've taught high school students Euclidean algorithm before. It gives them a sense not only from a computer science standpoint what an algorithm is, from just a mathematical standpoint what an algorithm is and how they work. You teach algorithms in the K-12 curriculum all the time. What's the first algorithm you might teach a student in the K-12 curriculum? Yeah. I don't know if this is the first, but you talked about it in number theory, but it's how you learn that they actually, during his generation as an elementary school student, they learned how to like count in mods. I, don't, I never. So that's an application of number theory um, to the K-12 curriculum, and it's one of the central tenets of number theory is modular arithmetic. Modular arithmetic is like you can see in the clock over there. There's numbers one through twelve. So if, you, if instead of twelve we wrote zero. Uh, the numbers 0 through 11, would, and you started counting on the clock the way you do, that would be modular, modular arithmetic mod 12. Uh, and you study that number theory, you study that type of new number system that you create, and you abstract the notion of addition and multiplication to that new number system uh, to give you like this abstract idea of taking two things and adding them in some way, and how do you define addition? You can define it on different sets and you get a different number system. Um, so I was thinking more along the lines of even even more basic algorithms you teach. One of the algorithms you teach to in the K-12 curriculum is long division. Right? There's a lot of time spent doing long division in the K-12 curriculum. Um, and that's something you study at length, both in discrete math and in number theory. It's, we call it the quotient remainder theorem. Um, but it is the foundation for almost all of the undergraduate number theory curriculum in the, in the elementary number theory course we teach here at TCNJ. It all begins sort of with the quotient remainder theorem. Because if you don't have a remainder, then you don't got anything. Um, okay, so what about reasoning? When do you use reasoning uh, in the undergraduate or, or in the K-12 curriculum? Yeah. Um, I'm teaching sixth grade right now, and I've noticed that they have a really hard time figuring out word problems, and I think it's just because their reasoning is shot. They immediately. The first thing that they think to do is like, oh, I've learned how to use a table, and they try to apply tables to every word problem that they have, and some of the word problems don't yeah. even mention values. Right. And so I think one of the things you learn as a number theory student is having to be forced to reason. Number theory is full of questions that are very easily stated very difficult to work through unless you think hard about them and reason with all the stuff you have at your disposal, all the, all the definitions that you've memorized and all the things you've seen in class come together, question after question after question that are very easily stated, but sort of force you to think about something brand new, some brand new idea each time. No two questions in number theory are the same, and they're going to force you to reason each time. And that, that can be very frustrating. I don't know if you've been through number theory and felt that frustration, how no two questions are exactly the same, no question shows up exactly like on the test that it was in the homework. All the questions are different, using the same definitions. And that frustration, that forcing you to reason time after time after time, 
is not only something you need to go through if you're going to teach people how to reason, but it's something that I think should be introduced in the K-12 curriculum a lot earlier than it is. Um, and that brings me to problem solving skills. Obviously there's a lot of problem solving skills that you learn in a course that's based solely on problem after problem after problem that is sort of easily stated but difficult to work through. And that's what number theory gives you. Um, I have a list of topics here, but I don't want to go over time. Um, and that was like six, 16 or 17 minutes, which goes within the 15 to 20. Um, so uh, I'll stop and I'll let people ask any questions they feel they want. Um, but I highly recommend you don't listen to me and you just do your own reading. And I think this is a good place to start. It's a book called Learning and Teaching Number Theory. And I'm going to read it now because I thought it was cool to read the introduction. But, You don't have to clap, it's a panel, it's fine. Does anyone have yeah. questions before Dr. Russell starts talking about abstract algebra? I didn't go deep into the topics of number theory, but like divisibility, long division, clock counting and modular arithmetic, um, developing new systems of numbers, abstracting your notions of addition and multiplication, so that when you talk about distributivity, when you talk about just addition and multiplication, you're not thinking, when I add two numbers, that's what addition is. You're thinking addition is this thing, and I can apply it to numbers, or I can apply it to other things if I just try to define it in the right way. And the sooner we get students thinking in those terms, probably the better. And there's definitely a lot of examples of number theory that you can bring to a K-12 class. Some of them more high school level, some of them, you know, all the way down, probably. Uh, you can probably get grade school students in K-6 to thinking about clock counting and developing a whole new version of addition for themselves without working too hard. Um, and I think it would be useful to bring that abstraction down to that level um, simply so that they get used to those kind of questions before they get hit in the head in a college course. Any questions? I have a comment if that's okay. Um, I'm pretty sure one of the first things I learned in number theory, well not learned, proved, I guess, proved in number theory um, were properties of exponents and huh. just proving different properties in general and that they, why they exist. Uh -huh. And I think that's just so important to yeah. know as a teacher because you're teaching your students these properties of who continually mix and mess them up. So it's important that you know why. Yeah. And one thing I'd like to make clear is probably everything I've said that I've tried to say is about number theory is about all of the math courses you'll see at TCNJ. So, so um, I don't think number theory is the queen of mathematics the way Gauss does necessarily. In fact, I'm not even a number theorist. Um, but I think it's a good example that gives really approachable problems. So that, that's the one distinction it has. Is you, can, you can be almost anyone and read, if you know something about numbers, you can read a number theory problem that's stated in like, chapter one of our book at TCNJ, and, and you, can, you can try to work on it. And there's even problems you can state to high school students that are unsolved to all mathematicians right now. That's kind of neat.